tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hey there, partners. Welcome back to Casa de Blood. Everyone accounted for and among the living? Good. I don't know what it is about Memorial Day, but some people's idea of remembering our honored dead is to get pissed drunk and fall face first on a barbecue. I hold y'all to a higher standard, you understand. The Druby Brothers are a dignified society. Speak of the devil. Get a couple beers in Chester here and he's weaving all over the road. Real lightweight if you ask me. Uh, at least he's a cheap date. Come on in, friend. We got work to do. Hmm. That's better. Alright, so tonight we've got a tale from Mr. Ryan Hartville. The second part of his epic in the making, Rough... Uh, Jew boy to Big D, Jew boy to Big D. Uh, Big D, do you copy? Over. What do you want, Jeffrey? Ryan Harville's kind of a big deal around here, Big D. Uh, could you maybe say his name with a little more, uh, Ryan Harville? You know? Over. Jeff, I don't know about this studio intercom thing. I'm trying to do a show here. Uh, you didn't say over. 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 All right. So tonight we've got part two of Rough Beast by author Ryan Harville. And talk about remembering our honored dead. We're coming off one hell of a rupture in the town of... Uh, 10 for Big D. Keep between the digits, good buddy. Over and out. Uh, well, smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigmarole. Ooh, can I do it? Over. Fine. Over. This is Season 2, Episode 6 of Drew Blood's Dark Tales. You are listening to the standard edition of this program. Uh, for as little as $5 a month, you can become a patron. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click uh, Patrons in the upper menu to sign up. You can add free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives. Got a story? Send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, uh, over and out. Well, the people have spoken and rough beasts are back. If you need a refresher, part one is just five episodes back, our season two premiere. When we last left you, Tep and his crew had defeated the crown, an apocalyptic angel who doesn't appreciate Tep's gift for typography. So without further delay, from author Ryan Harville, I give you Rough Beasts. Uh, part two. In Tep's dream, the desert was dark and cold, and the crush of sand chilled his bare feet with each tentative step he took. In the darkness, Everything was a threat. Every step filled with dangerous potential. In the distance was the jagged silhouette of a mountain range. Titans of earth looming and ready to rain down rock in a landslide that would swallow him whole. Hidden snakes that would only make themselves known by their teeth punching into the skin of his ankle. Scorpions skittering across the sand as soon as dusk fell over the desert. All of these things gnawed at his resolve to keep moving, but none scared him as much as the small candle spark ahead. If it was a spark at this distance, then how big was the actual flame? A fire in the desert meant purpose, meant someone had started it. That's what scared him. Someone was out there, waiting on him. A harsh wind blew, scouring sand into his face, his eyes, 
and with it came a voice. Welcome, Stephen. Called Tep by those you love. Welcome to the wastes. I am waiting for you. Come find me. Come find the truth and the light. Tep knew who it was then and what the flame represented. It was a torch. Tep woke in his bed, his pillow damp with sweat. He moaned and rolled over, spreading his limbs, searching for a cooler spot beneath his blanket. But try as he might, sleep would not return. He swung his legs out of bed and stood, pulling the straps of his suspenders over his bare shoulders. When Tep entered the front room, Granddaddy Mose placed a plate of fried eggs on the table before him. Uh, breakfast, he said. I waited till I heard you stirring before I started cooking. Thanks, Tep said, and sat down in the chair in front of the plate. What time is it? Half past nine, Granddaddy said. Hey, I'll let you sleep in a bit. Figured you might need it. Lila sat opposite him, a Bible spread before her. She noticed him staring and looked up from her book. Good morning, Tep, she said. Just doing some research. Did you sleep well? No, Tep blurted out before he could stop himself. I... I had a dream. Most people do, you know. Yeah, I know. But this wasn't like a normal one. It felt real somehow. Like a vision? I never had a vision, Tep said. He prodded one of the eggs with his fork, its golden orange yolk spilling out and running onto his plate. I mean, the glyphs do come in dreams, but that's not the same as this. When glyphs come to me, it's like a bright light filling the room, but the light is all lines. Crossing over each other like when I was younger and used to watch old Miss Crenshaw weaving baskets out of the deer grass. This dream last night felt just as real as talking to you right now does. You want to tell me about it? Lila said, leaning on her elbows. Maybe I can help. Granddaddy sat down beside him, bringing two cups of coffee to the table. Ah. Tell her, Tip, he said, sliding one of the cups over to him. Eh, yeah. she might can work some witchy voodoo and pull some answers out your head. <laughs> Nothing like that, Lila said with a smile. But I'll help you figure it out however I can. I think that's the problem, Tip said. I believe I know what it is, and it ain't good. Uh, go on, boy. Quit stringing us along. Okay, Tip said. It's dark, the blackest night I've ever seen. I'm alone walking through the desert. I can feel the sand between my toes, the wind blowing against me, and danger all around. Then there's a little light out yonder, and it gets bigger as I get closer. Then a voice come out of nowhere and says to come find it, to come find the truth and the light. That's all it said? Lila asked. Yeah, that's about it. Other than that, it called me by name. Whoever he is, he's out there in the desert, and he wants me to find him. The light, Lila said. What do you think it means? I think it's a torch, Tep said. I think someone wants me to cross into the desert, and he's got a torch burning just for me. Ah, the torch bearer, Granddaddy said. Well, I be damned. Here we are looking for answers, and they just appear out of nowhere, out in the desert. Lila, have you ever known something like this? Tep asked. Not the torchbearer exactly, but, I don't know, some kind of witch vision? She shook her head. Not that I can recall. The crown seemed upset that the torchbearer had somehow given you the ability to use glyphs, but didn't say nothing like that to me. So... If there's a counterpart to the torchbearer for witches, it ain't never bothered to reach out to me, dream or otherwise. Hmm. I think it's about time we all had a talk, Granddaddy said. Abel and Sutter should be back after a while, Lila said. They went into town to collect the reward money. Do you want to wait? 
No, this part ain't none of their concern for now. Mm, this talk is for magic folk only. We need to share what we know. And maybe we have a better grip on things. How do you mean? Lila said. Granddaddy took a long sip of his coffee, then began. Oh, the only other witch I ever had the pleasure of knowing was Tep's mother. Hmm. I ain't gonna get down to the details about what happened, but by the time I found out she was a witch, she was already dying. Mm-mm-mm. Mm, spent the last of what power she had left bringing baby Tep back from the dead. Mm. Jesus, Lila said. I'm so sorry for both of you. Tep, I didn't know your mother was a witch. Neither did I until the night you showed up here, Tep said. Pioneer, I ain't never had the opportunity to talk about what I'm talking about now. Mm. Gravens are witches. We ain't the same, sure, but we gotta be connected somehow, right? When I posed this possibility to Tip, he called it a counterbalance, and maybe he right. Shit, I don't know, but it has a little feeling of truth to it. Hmm. The world start going to shit, that demons start flying up out the ground, and suddenly I laid up on some dusty road with angel letters being pounded into my skull. Hmm. And that's how it happened? Lila said. Like, you just woke up and knew a magical language? Well, it was a sight more painful than that, Granddaddy said. Mm-hmm. It damn near killed me. Did kill me, according to tell Mama. She brought me back. Mm, I stopped it from happening. Either way, I'm still kicking. Hey, so my first point that I'm rambling on to is this. Hmm. When did you know you was a witch? Lila thought about it for a moment. I've known since I was about five, I'd guess. How old are you now? Tep asked. Tep, Granddaddy said. You don't ever ask a lady her age. Why? Hmm. <laughs> Just plain rude. Luckily, I'm old and don't give a shit about such thing anymore, huh? So fess up, Lila. <laughs> Lila laughed. A sound as bright as bells to Tep's ears. I'm 23, she said. Granddaddy stroked his wild, near-white beard. Uh-huh. So that'd be about 18 years ago. Same time as the rupture. Well, yeah, Lila said. I guess I've never thought about it that way. The first time I'd ever used magic was on the road, running from the east. My daddy was out looking for food when some strange men came into our camp. And they started harassing me and my mama. And I... I lashed out. I didn't know what I was doing. My emotions just took over. And it just happened. One man dropped dead on the spot. And the other ran. Holy shit, Tep said. You killed a man when you were five? I ain't proud of it, Lila said, a stern edge to her voice. I wish I'd been able to handle it different, but I wasn't mature enough yet. It's like trying to stop a toddler from having a tantrum. The toddler doesn't know no better, just knows it's upset. I didn't mean it like that, Tep said. I was just surprised. No harm done, she said. Mm, let's get this here train back on the tracks. Mm, we done established that there might be a connection here. Mm, the rupture happened. And within a few weeks, maybe, we got witches and gravens springing up. Well, there's always been witches, Tep said. There's always been stories about witches, and they don't exactly match up with what we can do. Which is what exactly? I mean, I know you can heal people, but what about the, uh, other stuff? She sighed. I can influence people's bodies. I can't read minds, make potions... Or talk to trees. But I can stop your heart from beating just as quick as I can heal a knife wound. Quicker, actually. Breaking is a lot easier than fixing in my experience. So, with the crown... I made its muscles tighten till he couldn't move them. Or at least I tried. Works a lot better on humans and demons. And that demon's head? She smiled. Made all its blood rush up to its head. Then made it leave just as quick. 
and told its skull to go along with it. Tip frowned. I don't really understand. Neither do I, she said. It's a feeling, not an equation. I know what to do when I do it, but I can't rightly explain much beyond that. Hmm. Yeah, makes sense. It does, Tip said. Use your brain, boy. How do you know what a glyph means? Especially when they're all stacked on top of each other. It's like letters, Tip said, staring down into his coffee. Letters that mean more than just a letter, though. A letter that can mean a thought or phrase or an intention? Lila asked. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. I can carve the fire glyph into a piece of wood, but that don't mean it's going to catch. I have to want it to and have to concentrate on it. The boy's got the gist of it, Granddaddy said, then turned to Lila. Hey, that's why we stack them on top of one another, see? You could just etch cold on something, but if you start with cold, then lay freeze down over it, then ice over there. Well, now, you start building up a mighty powerful glyph. A glyph that knows exactly its purpose. What you intend for it? Yeah. That, Lila said, is a lot to remember. Granddaddy shrugged. Uh, only when I say it out loud like that. But for me and Teb, it's as easy as breathing. Just as easy as your magic works for you. I still don't see the connection, though, Lila said. Other than the times matching up. Maybe that's the important part, though, Tep said. Someone or something gave us these things to work with. To fight back against what's happening to the world. God? Lila asked. Granddaddy shook his head. I ain't saying that it ain't. But it's mighty strange that his plan is for the world to end. Only to turn around and give us tools to fight it. Even if we knew all about it, like there was some divine plan. It still don't tell us what to do, Tep said. Do we just sit and wait for another attack? It ain't like we know when one's gonna pop up. Granddaddy smiled. Huh, don't you fret none. Oh, Mose knows. I think we needs to make ourselves a trip out into the desert. Yeah, meet the man behind the torch. Yeah. <laughs> what? Granddaddy, we don't... There's a lot we don't know, boy. But we ain't gonna know if we just sit around waiting to find out neither. Hmm. He has a point, Lila said. Granddaddy dropped her a wink. Hmm. Thank you, witch. <laughs> You're welcome, old man, she said with a smile. Ha <laughs> ha. Guess I'm outvoted then, Tep said. You think Abel and Sutter will go along with it? Let's find out, she said and stood. They've been gone a while. Probably went to see the elephant and found the beer or three somewhere. Let's go hunt them down. I could use a walk anyway. Granddaddy gave them a dismissive wave of his hand. Go on now, you two. I gotta finish the chores Tep didn't do this morning while his lazy ass slept. Ha! <laughs> Come on, Tep said. You can't let me sleep in and then turn around and make me feel guilty for it. Oh, the hell I can't. Now get. Hmm. I'm sure there'll still be things waiting on you when you get back. Let's go, Tep, Lila said. Before we find something else to give you guilt over. Oh, I'm sure I think of something, Moe said, and went back to his coffee. Hmm, I'll be packing the essentials while y'all are out. I ain't gonna beat around this here bush. It could be a long walk. And if we ain't properly prepared, it could be the end of us. Tep started down the hall and called back. Don't worry. That bush is safe, but I'm scared as shit. What you scared for? (laughs) You ain't the one looking down the barrel of 70 years old and about to trek across the damn desert? Shit. The vultures won't even wait for me to kill over. (laughs) They'll just stop pecking at me for too long. (laughs) Tep laughed. (laughs) Don't you worry about that. Your meat is too tough to eat, old man. (laughs) You damn right. (laughs) Granddaddy said with a laugh and a hard smack to his thigh. Yeah, tough as nails, and don't you go forgetting that. Tip got dressed as quickly as he could and met Lila outside, his heavy guns weighing on his hips. I gotta get used to carrying these. It feels weird, like they're keeping me grounded and off balance at the same time. Not surprised. They're hunks of metal, 
designed to kill things. The guns have the weight of steel, but also the weight of responsibility. It's quite a burden. Tep turned that over in his mind as they walked down the half of the street that wasn't a cracked ruin. Some helpful townsfolk had driven some stakes down around the edges of the deepest cracks, ropes strung between them. Tep leaned over and looked down. It was dark, sure, but he could still see the bottom if he squinted. That's strange, he said. I thought it'd be bottomless or, or something. How'd they even get up here? Magic, maybe? Lila said. Then why couldn't they just appear anywhere? No clue. Maybe they can't. Maybe it has to be out of the earth. Okay. Good. If we can all just learn to fly, we'd be safe. They laughed, but Tip sounded forced even to his own ears. It had brought the crown to mind its great wings casting a shadow even in all the smoke. Tip hadn't even noticed the sound of hammering until it stopped suddenly. Three men were out front of one of the shops nailing together new coffins. They were already stacked in piles three or four high, the wood fresh enough to bleed sap, its scent reaching his nostrils even through the dust. The men stared at them as Lila and Tip passed. You looking for your friends? said Jeb Taylor the closest of the men. The other two men didn't so much as glance in Tep's direction. Yes, sir. You seen him around? He pointed his hammer down the street. Check with the sheriff. I think those boys got tanked at Rudy's and ended up in a fight. He may have them sequestered for a while. Tep sighed, unsurprised. Thanks, Jeb. Do you fellas need any help? No, Jeb said. We're all doing for our own dead. It's better this way gives me something to do. Tip looked at the coffin Jeb was building, noticing how small it was. He nodded to the man. All right, he said. What else could he say? Those two idiots, Lila said as they moved on. Now Abel causing the ruckus don't surprise me none, but Sutton knows better and can usually tug Abel's reins when he gets rowdy. I guess coming close to dying might have gotten to him, Tip said. It ain't like it's never happened before, she said. Come on, let's go fetch him up. Before long, they were stepping up onto the wide porch of the once shop, now sheriff's office. Tep pushed the door open and they walked in. The inside was gloomy. Only one small window let any sunlight in. The beam filled with floating dust. Sheriff Avery was leaning back in his chair, his heavy jowls resting on his chest, his hands behind his head. He sat up as they walked in. Morning, Sheriff Avery, Tep said, removing his hat. I hear two gentlemen may have caused a dust-up over at Rudy's. So, you come to fetch your partners? Yes, sir. I... From the rear of the building came knocking and pounding, accompanied by muffled yells. Well, now, the sheriff said. Sounds like they're up and at them again. You can go on back there and let them out. Door at the end of the hall. Just pull the bolt to the side. Much obliged, Sheriff, Tep said. Then Delilah. All right. Let's see what kind of sorry state they're in. The door at the end of the hall was thick and rough-hewn, a steel bolt keeping it closed from the outside. Tep slid the bolt out from its shackle and opened the door. Sutter was half-collapsed against the back wall, his eyelids fluttering and trying to open, chains leading from his wrist to the wall holding him in place. Abel's eyes were wide and wild as he screamed behind this gag and shook his head back and forth. What the hell? Tep said, and quickly crossed over to where Abel lay. He hooked a finger into the man's mouth and pulled the old rag free. (laughs) It's a damn trap, boy! Tep's hands flew to the smooth grips of his revolvers as two distinct sounds reached his ears. A thud and a thump. He wheeled around on his heels and drew, cocking both hammers back on the go. There stood Jeb Taylor, his coffin hammer still in hand, a smear of bright blood on his head. Lila was crumpled at his feet, unconscious or dead, Tep couldn't tell. Sheriff Avery walked up next to him, his double-action service revolver pointed at Lila's head. Why don't you go on and reseat those hammers, the sheriff said. Then slide the bulldozers over to Mr. Taylor here. You jib-faced son of a bitch, Abel said. 
You best to kill me now, cause if I'm ever loosened, I promise I'm gonna plow your thick skull with a bullet. Well then, I guess I'm lucky you ain't getting free now, ain't I? Avery said. He faced Jeb, stored the boy's guns with the others, and let him get shackled up till we know what he wants done with these three gentlemen. Tep thumbed the hammers of his revolvers back into place and placed the guns on the floor, then gave them each a push toward Jeb. The man scooped him up and walked around Avery and out of the room. You gonna tell me what's happening here, Sheriff? Tep asked, keeping his voice as calm as he could manage. There's gotta be some misunderstanding. No, I understand everything just fine, Avery said. You boys are being charged with murder among a bunch of other things. I don't have to get my list because I can't remember them all. It's a long list, you see. Murder, Abel said with a not quite sane laugh. <laughs> we just saved your shithole town, you dump buck whore son. You may want to watch how you speak to me, Avery said. I can make your stay here mighty, mighty unpleasant. You ain't gonna disrespect the law, not in my town. And you damn sure ain't gonna talk to a white man like that besides. Abel's lips split into a grin as he opened his mouth to speak. Avery looked down at Lila and squeezed the trigger. Not enough to fire, but just enough that they could all see the space between the hammer and bullet, between life and death. Abel closed his mouth. That's better, Avery said. Now, Ted. Why don't you just go over and have a seat next to your friends? Tep did as he was told, sitting down beside Sutter, his back facing the wall. Jeb came back into the room, shackles dangling from his hand. Stick out your hands, he said. Why are you doing this? Tep asked. Cause my boy is dead. My little boy hadn't even his eighth year out. Now he's dead. Mr. Taylor. Jeb, I swear to you, we saved as many as we could, Tep pleaded. All of us did. We... Twasn't a demon what killed him. Was a bullet. A bullet with some of your evil little drawings on it. Tep's mind raced through the events of that day, trying to find a memory of the Taylor boy, but found none. It was just a haze, a blur of smoke and battle screams. Faces in the smoke. Faces torn apart by their bullets. Could the boy have been turned? His pupils stretched into ebony rectangles as the whites around them yellowed? God, he hoped so. Because the alternative made his stomach twist itself into a knotted loop of guilt. He had told Abel they should be more careful. But in the end, he had followed right along. Could they really have gunned down an innocent boy? He didn't know. So he put his hands out and allowed Jeb to tighten the iron cuffs around his wrists and sat still as he fixed him to a chain that was anchored into the wall. Good, Sheriff Avery said. Now drag the witch out, then send word to the pastor that we got them all under lock and key. He should have the rest of the pieces in place by now. Pastor Stone, Tep said. What's he got to do with this? Hush now, boy, Avery said backing out of the door as Jeb dragged Lila's limp body into the hall. You'll find out soon enough, I promise. Sheriff Avery, Abel said, dark hilarity seething in his voice. With all due respect to you, your station as a lawman, and the pristine whiteness of your skin, I implore you to remember my promise as well. Pray that I don't get free. Pray hard. <laughs> Avery sneered over his shoulder, but Tep could see a flicker of fear behind the expression, and it made his heart glad. The door was slammed shut, and the bolt slid into place. Tep stretched his arms as far as he could and gently shook Sutter. Sutter, you okay? Tep said. You gotta wake up. Leave him be, Abel said, slumping against the wall. He's either gonna wake up or he ain't. You ain't worried? That's your partner, man. Course I'm worried, but worrying ain't gonna change nothing. Tell me what happened, Tep said. How'd y'all get caught? They set us up, Abel said. Bunch of guys, that Jeb Taylor and his boys, said they wanted to buy us a drink on account of us saving the town and all. A few drinks later, they offered to buy me a lady for an hour. 
I went to follow. Sut tried to top me out of it, but I went. We go through an alley, and they hit me over the head with something heavy, and I blacked out. I assume something similar happened to Sutter. Either way, we woke up here. Caught them assholes. They got no right to lock us up. Maybe, Tep said. Maybe some people were caught in our crossfire. Maybe some innocent people... Abel shook his head and winced at the motion. We talking about this again, he said. Every single one of them would be dead if it weren't for us. <sighs> the town would be ash scattered across the desert floor, you hear me? So what if we pop some goat-eyed kid? Tep felt the coldness within his chest. Did you? Did you shoot Jep's boy? I don't know, and I don't care, Abel said. And you shouldn't either. That kid was dead already. That's what you and the rest of them ain't getting. There ain't no coming back from it. A demon gets its claw into you, gets you with that poison. It's done. You, done. You done. You're going to be savage till you get put down. No, I don't remember shooting no kid. But it wouldn't matter if I did. Because if I did, that means I did him a favor. Now, I'm done talking about it because there ain't nothing left to say. There was a silence for a moment while Tep decided to drop it and move on. Fine, he said. Any idea why they took Lila instead of stashing her in here with us? No ideas that don't involve very bad things, Abel said. They knocked her out without saying a word, whatever the reason. They're afraid of her, Sutter slurred. <sighs> She's the most powerful and the most dangerous. Tep let out a long sigh. Thank God you're alive. For now, Sutter said. The way my head feels, I kind of wish I hadn't woke up at all. Good to see you moving, partner, Abel said. Sutter nodded. I'll be all right. It's Lila we need to worry about. They all saw what she can do, so they're taking every precaution. Uh, probably got her locked up somewhere in the dark keeping her quiet and confused. We gotta get out of here before it's too late to help her. Too late, Tep said. What do you mean? Town's full of scared, grieving people who want someone to blame for their grief. <sighs> well, there's no monsters left to fight here, so they'll make some. Shit, Abel said. What do you think they got in mind? Sutter gently shook his head. I don't know for certain, but I can tell you this much. History speaking, when an angry mob gets their hands on a witch, bad things happen. If she's lucky, they'll just hang her. If she ain't lucky, well, it's gonna be a whole hell of a lot worse. We ain't gonna let that happen, Tep said, an idea sparking the life in his head. Sut, can you reach enough to get the pouch out of my belt? Sutter bent himself sideways at the waist with a groan and reached over. Uh, I got it, he said. What you got? Oh, man, what a bunch of idiots. He handed Tep the burin he had fished out from the pouch. I can't believe they didn't search you. Didn't search any of us past our guns, Abel said. I can still feel my knife in my boot. A lot of good it does me at the moment. Abel, keep an ear out for footsteps heading our way, Tep said. Now, Sutter, reach over me. Sutter did as he was asked, presenting his cuffs to Tep. Can you pick a lock with that thing? No, too big. But I might still get us free. A fair warning, though. It's probably going to hurt. Sutter shrugged. That seems to be how today is going. Go on, Tep. Do what you gotta do. Tep held the cuff still with one hand and began etching on the crossbar between them, holding the burin like a pencil for stability. He started slowly, letting the lines flow from his head down to his hand and onto the metal. With a few careful strokes, he had etched the glyph fire, the foundation, then he began to build the rest of the glyph in earnest, overlaying fire with heat, then adding boil as slivers of steel fell away. 
The metal had already started to heat up before he finished with the final glyph. Melt. I'm sorry about this, son, Tep said, palming the sweat from his brow. I hope it doesn't get too bad. Within seconds, the crossbar had begun to glow a deep red, then nearly white as sparks popped from the surface. Sutter's mouth tightened into a thin line. <laughs> God damn, that's hot, he grunted, blisters already forming on his skin near the cuffs. The metal began to melt, and a single dark drop fell onto the floor and landed with a hiss. Try and twist them, Tep said. The heat's going to destroy the glyph, so you got to give it a hand for it's gone. Sutter gritted his teeth and began to push his hands opposite from one another. One up and one down and back and forth like he was wringing water from a cloth. Holy shit, Abel said, his eyes as wide as his smile. Twist, you son of a bitch, you almost got it. The crossbar snapped with a ping and Sutter held his hands up staring at the bright twist of broken metal as the chain fell away. I'll be damned, <laughs> he said with a chuckle. That was smart, boy. I didn't know you could even make a glyph hot enough to melt through steel. Neither did I, Tep admitted shakily. But it was all I could think of. Sutter clapped him on the shoulder. Your granddaddy's gonna be proud. Just let me be the one to tell the story. In my version, you'll be cool and confident instead of unsure and apt to wet yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Deal, Tep said. Now to get the rest of us out. The words barely left his lips before a cry echoed down the hall. That was Lila, Abel said. Those motherfuckers! Tep got as close as he could to the anchor holding the chain to the wall. He began to etch not on the anchor, but beside it onto the wood it was sunk into. Weak, he carved, then brittle and frail. Sut, he said. Grab the chain and help me pull. Tep leaned and let his weight hang onto the chain as Sutter grabbed it with both blistered hands. They pulled, and the anchor tore from the wood with a hail of splinters. Tep rushed over to Abel and the men repeated the process, the anchor coming loose much faster with their strength combined. Abel held his cuffed hands up, the chain dangling between them. I'll skip the burns. Let's just get out of here and get the keys. I can't handle the door without magic, Sutter said. He reached down and lifted the end of Abel's pant leg. Huh. You could at least buy a man a drink first, Sut, Abel said. Sutter pulled the knife from Abel's boot and went to the door. This ain't no proper jail. What was it? Used to be a store or something. Tep said. Thought so. That's why they had us chained up on the other end of this room. Cause this door is easy pickings. He placed a knife's tip under the head of the bolt holding the hinge together. Tilting the handle down, he gave the butt a shove with the heel of his palm. The bolt popped loose and tumbled down, and Abel deftly caught it before it struck the floor. Sutter knelt to take care of the second hinge. Get ready, he said. Tep and Abel placed their hands against the door and held it firmly as Sutter loosened the second bolt. Once it was free, they gently moved the door aside. I'll take point, Sutter whispered, brandishing the knife. Why do you get to have the knife? Abel hissed. It's my damn knife. Cause I got two free hands. Fine, they'll shoot you first anyway. As far as Tep could see, the front room looked empty. He tapped Sutter on the shoulder and got the man's attention, then pointing to the only other door in the hall. Sutter nodded and stepped over to it, resting his ear against the wood. After a moment, he nodded again, then mind kicking in the door. Tep and Abel nodded in unison. Sutter took a step back, lifted his foot, and slammed it into the door. <laughs> It flew open with a crash, the top hinge coming free as it struck the wall behind. By the time Tep could see past Sutter's broad shoulders, the man was already lunging into the room and had the sheriff by the lapels of his coat, the knife blade under his chins. Jeb stood in the corner of the room, beside a desk where Lila lay prone, a pool of blood widening around her head. 
The man's eyes flicked to a spot near the door, then back at Tep. Tep followed his gaze and saw their guns lying on a chair. He reached down with his cuffed hands and grabbed his father's revolver, aiming it and drawing the hammer back in one motion. Jeb raised his hands, one still holding a dripping knife. Tep motioned to Jeb with the revolver. Drop the knife and move, Tep said. The man obeyed, stepping away from the desk and letting the knife fall from his fingers. Sutter reached down with his free hand and tore the sheriff's key ring from the man's belt loop. He tossed him to Abel, who found the right key within seconds and set his wrist free, sending the cuffs clattering to the floor. Sut, give me the knife and go check on Lila, Abel said. I'll keep an eye on our friend here. Sutter handed the blade over and walked to the desk. He gingerly turned Lila's face to his own. He looked to Jeb. What have you done to her? I had to stop her from speaking any spells, Jeb said. Sutter's expression changed, tightening into a grimace. He slowly pushed down on Lila's chin. Blood flowed freely from her mouth, spilling from between her lips. They cut out her tongue, Sutter said, his voice thick. The bastards took her goddamn tongue. If he said anything else, Tip didn't hear. His eyes went from Lila's bloodied face to Jeb's, whose features were slack with fear. Tip squeezed the trigger. The crash was deafening in the confines of the room. <laughs> Jeb flinched and looked down in disbelief at the hole in the middle of his chest. Blood pumped out in weak spurts as Jeb tried to stop the flow with his hands. The man slowly sank to the floor, revealing the bloody hole in the wood behind them. Couldn't have said it better myself, young Tep, Abel said. Tep swallowed hard. I shot him, he said. His voice sounded distant in his ears. Just burned him down. Yep, and we all thank you for it, Abel said then turned his attention back to the sheriff. Now, I believe you were saying something about a pastor earlier. Where can we find this fine holy man? I believe we have some things to talk about. No need, Avery spat. He's probably back by now, a posse with him. We're going to watch the rest of you hang. Abel chuckled. <laughs> you ain't going to be watching shit. He drew the knife back, then buried it to the hilt in the sheriff's ample gut. <coughs> Avery let loose a cry as Abel withdrew the blade, then slammed it home once more. Abel leaned in close, his mouth near the sheriff's ear. I told you, he said softly. I fucking told you, didn't I? Sheriff Avery nodded weakly, his eyes wide and wet. I told you to pray I never got loose, Abel said. He pulled the blade back, slinging a line of bright blood drops across the dusty floor before he drove it into Sheriff Avery's neck. Blood rushed out in a glut, and Abel let the man fall to his feet. Guess God ain't listening today. There was a silent beat as Tep stared at Abel, who stood like a blood-stained wraith, unreal and strange. I need some help over here, Sutter said. He held a small brown bottle up for them to see. Ether, I don't know how long she's going to be knocked out. I'm going to have to carry her from here. Tep arranged her legs closer together to help lift her, wrapping her cloak around them like a blanket. He stopped. Her cloak? God damn, I feel like an idiot. Sut, help me turn her on her back. We do that and she's liable to choke on blood, Sutter said. I'll be fast, I promise. Sutter turned her over, pushing one shoulder until her face was exposed. The juxtaposition between her pale skin and dark blood nearly took Tep's breath away. He unfastened the silver that held her cloak together across her chest. It wasn't much bigger than a button, with a small glyph etched on the front. What's it say? Close, Tep said. As in, like, distance. Not like a door or anything. 
I guess she had problems keeping her cloak closed. I don't know where she got it made, but it was one of the first things I noticed about her. He pulled the burin from his pouch and quickly went to work, layering a healing glyph onto the silver. He blew the small shavings of silver off and then gently pushed a piece of silver past her bloody lips and teeth until it was resting as close to the wound as he could get it. It ain't perfect, but it'll stop the bleeding quickly, Tep said. Will it stay put? Sutter asked. Yeah, it should stick there like a scab. It knows what it's supposed to do. I trust you, Sutter said. He slid his arms beneath her and picked her up with a grunt, cradling her to his chest like a baby. Now, let's get the fuck out of here. Abel lifted Sut's rifle, slung it over his shoulder, then retrieved his revolver, checking the chambers before stowing it away in its holster. We ready? Tep asked, buckling his gun belt around his waist. Sut nodded. Abel said, I'll go first this time. Sut, you and Lila behind me. Tip, you watch our backs. They walked down the hall and into the front room. Abel stepped to the window and slowly peered out. Shit, he said. That pastor's out there with half the men left in town. They got guns and... Abel trailed off. What else? Sut said. What'd you see? Abel shook his head. Nothing. But there's just a lot of them. Let's see if there's a back way out. Sut stood firm, his brow knitted. Abel, we've been running together a long time, and your face is nearly as pale as mine right now. What's going on? I... Abel began before Tep spoke up. I'll check it out, Tep said and took two strides toward the window. No, Abel said, stepping in front of him. We're just gonna look and see if there's another way. What's your problem? I ain't got a problem, kid. Just do as I say. I don't take orders from you, Abel. I run the beast. You're a beast now. So what I say goes, boy. Now go look for another way out. Abel, I swear if you're hiding something from us. I ain't hiding anything. Now do as you're told, Abel said, giving Tip a push to the chest. Don't you ever put your hands on me again. Y'all knock this shit off, Sutter said. I ain't putting her down to pull you two off each other. Tip stepped past Abel glaring at the man as he did. Tep, Abel said. Tep stopped, something in Abel's voice giving him pause. Don't, all right? Just trust me on this. Let's find another way. Tep scoffed and went to the window. Pastor Stone had gathered a posse, all right. Nearly twenty men stood around them, all of them looking armed, mostly rifles. The pastor himself faced what Tip realized was the thing Jeb and the other men had really been building. Its parts probably hidden behind the coffins, ready to be assembled in the middle of town. Gallows. A single rope hung there, a man's body swinging gently from the noose. The man's dreadlocks covered his face, but Tip could still see Granddaddy's beard beneath. As if from far away, he heard Abel say, I tried to stop him from looking, Sut. I tried. Tep had no words, no sounds, nothing to express. Anger and grief bloomed within his chest, threatening to choke him with their collected mass. He ran his hands over his hair, feeling the oil there, the dust that had gathered. It felt real, but couldn't be because none of this was real. There wasn't a world without his grandfather, so this couldn't be happening. He shook and began to pace as he found his voice. A guttural noise at the back of his throat that was the spawn of a growl and a sob. Hot tears welled up in his eyes. No, Sut said. It isn't. It is, Abel said, then turned to Tip. Tip, listen. We gotta play this smart. This ain't no time to do something foolish. Let's get Lila out of here and regroup, then. Tip didn't hear the rest as he reached for the door and swung it open.
None of the crowd was looking his way. He drew his revolvers and cocked the hammers back. He hesitated for a second, unsure. Then he looked to his granddaddy once more, and red creeped into the edges of his vision as he finally understood what pure hatred felt like. Tep opened fire, the shots ringing out across the town square as the bullets found their targets. He'd down three men before anyone else had gathered their wits enough to locate where the shots were coming from. Two men aimed their rifles and Tep knelt as he held up his father's revolver before him. The rifle's bullet skimmed the surface of the glyph's shield and flew to either side of him. All the while, he kept firing with his other gun and watched as two men were torn apart by an explosion. Tep realized he didn't know which glyph bullets he had loaded and found he didn't much care. They'd all kill just the same. His gun clicked empty as Abel grabbed him under the arms and began to drag him back inside. <sighs> Let me go! Tep screamed. Let me! You're gonna get yourself killed! Abel cried. As if to prove his point, a volley of gunfire sounded as bullets slammed into the wall before them. Abel slammed the door closed and stayed low. God damn it, Tep! We needed a goddamn plan! Listen to him, Tep, Sutter said. He had lowered Lila to the ground and was covering her body with his own. Mose wouldn't want you to throw your life away, and you know it. The gunfire from outside increased. Bullets pounded holes through the door, the walls, and sent the glass from the windows flying inward. Guns in hand, Tet put the heels of his palms to his eyes and let out one choked sob. <laughs> I want them dead, he said. <laughs> Every last one of them. Dead! Abel reached across the floor and placed his hand on Tep's arm. You have your revenge. I promise. But not right now. We gotta get out of here. If there ain't another door in the back, then you gotta make us one. You understand? We need you, Tep. Tep nodded, tears running down the sides of his face. <laughs> okay, he said. Okay, you're right. We'll... Sutter cried out, his hands slapping over his ribs as he fell to his side. Sutter! Abel cried and crawled over to where Sutter lay panting. Tep watched as Abel moved Sutter's hand to get a better look. God damn it, Sut, he said. God damn it all! Bad, huh? I don't really feel anything there at all. You're gonna, Abel said, putting his hands over the wound. Just give it a few minutes. I've been shot before, Abel, Sutter said, and tapped the scar on his head. Remember this? <laughs> How could I forget? You were carrying on like a bleating sheep. That's cause it fucking hurt. <laughs> <laughs> his laugh turning into a cough with drops of blood flying from his lips. Tep, get the fuck over here, Abel said. Tep crawled to the men. Show me, he said. Abel lifted his hands. The wound was two inches below his chest. As Tep watched, blood bubbled with each of Souther's ragged breaths. It's got your lung, Tep said. I don't... I don't think I can help. What do you mean you can't help? Abel said, his voice rising. I don't have time to carve a glyph powerful enough to reach all the way in there. Well, you better think of something quick, or else... Quiet down, Abel. The shooting has stopped. They all closed their mouths and listened. No more gunfire split the sky outside. They reloading, Tep said. Abel shook his head. No, they're pushing forward. None of us return fire. They're coming to see if we're dead. Get Lila and get out, Sutter said. Leave me be. If it's my time, 
then it's my time. Sut, don't fucking argue with me. Get them out safe. Then come back later and kill the bastards. Tep heard the swish of footsteps and dust. We gotta go, Abel. You in there. A voice called from outside. Come on out and we'll make it quick. I give my word as a man of God. Fuck the both of you! Abel cried over his shoulder. Tep rolled over onto his back and began to reload. Abel! He managed before the pastor spoke again. I'll not warn you again, Pastor Stone said. If we have to come to get you, then things will be so much worse. You're welcome to try, asshole! The world erupted into gunfire once more. Tep kept as still as he could, and Abel laid down beside Sutter. Even through squinted eyes, Tep could see Sutter's chest was no longer rising and falling. He's gone, Abel! Tep cried over the noise. We can't do nothing else! I ain't leaving him! Abel screamed as a white glow shined upon his face. Lila, her eyes half shut, her bloody hair plastered to the side of her face, reached one glowing hand up to Sutter and laid it upon this wound. Tep didn't know how long the moment stretched on. It couldn't have been for more than a few heartbeats, but felt like far, far longer. Sutter came alive, coughing and shuddering. Abel quickly pressed him to the ground. Stay still, Sut, he said. We ain't gonna have you getting shot again. The glow dwindled, and Lila moved her closed hand away before opening it and letting the flattened bullet fall to the floor. The gunfire ceased once more. All right, men, the pastor said. Go fetch them. Lila raised herself up to a sitting position, and Tep was on his feet, grabbing her hands and helping her stand. Abel touched her arm, and she looked down at him. Thank you, he said. Lila nodded, then led Tep to the door, pushing it open and stepping outside. The pastor's pale face dropped in shock, and he froze in place. The men raised their rifles and revolvers, but their motion slowed, then stopped. Lila stood in fury, the slackness leaving her posture, the heaviness of her eyelids lifting. She held her hands before her, fingers splayed and trembling before she slowly tightened them into fists. The crowd of men turned their weapons upon themselves. Rifles pointed to cousins and pistols to brothers as each man took aim at another. What the hell are you doing? It ain't Cries rang out of the throng. Don't point that shit at me. I ain't doing it. It's the witch. Somebody shoot her. I can't. As they bickered and argued, the pastor hadn't moved so much as an inch, and no weapon was pointed at him. Lila's hand fell upon Tep's shoulder, her fingers tightening and squeezing the muscle there. He felt a strange pressure radiating from her touch, climbing the side of his neck and into his throat, and suddenly he was speaking, but the words were not his own. Why? Tep said loud enough for all to hear Lila's words out of his mouth. Why do you attack us? Mutilate us? Kill us? Not two days have passed since we saved this town from the demons. Drove them back into their holes so that you would continue to live out what time you have left on this cursed earth. Why have you taken my tongue? So, Pastor Stone gasped, so you couldn't speak your spells. Couldn't work your magic. Her outstretched hand turned slowly, and the pastor screamed, his limbs rigid. How's that working out for you? Lila said from Tep's mouth. I don't need my tongue to kill every one of you. All you've done is pissed me off. Then kill us, witch. You've already damned us, so kill us and be done with it. What is he talking about? Tep thought, 
and was surprised when Lila's voice answered him within his mind. I don't know, but we're going to find out. Wait, you can hear me? I guess so. I ain't never done this before. Ask him what he means. What you mean we damned you? Tip said. We saved as many as we could, then drove up. One of God's own angels, the pastor spat at him. Sent from heaven to lead us back with him. To save us from this tribulation. I don't know what you think you saw, Tep said. But whatever it was brought those demons with it. If it was taking you to heaven, then it was definitely going to be the hard way. The pastor tried to shake his head. It doesn't matter the means. We would have been in paradise shortly. And now our only resort is to rid the town of you and your ilk. Then maybe he will see we're worthy and return for our souls to take us to paradise. Then why'd you kill my granddaddy, you son of a bitch? That man should have been taken care of a long time ago. Both of you. Working magics and God knows what else on that farm. Tep gently removed Lila's hand from his shoulder and walked down the few steps of the front porch. He pointed at a man in the crowd. Mr. Thomas, he said. When your little girl got sick and couldn't keep nothing she ate down, who'd you go to? Did you go to the pastor here? Or did you go to my granddaddy for a glyph to soothe her stomach? Thomas looked away. And you, Mr. Sullivan, Tep said, facing a different man. When you and your wife were having trouble catching pregnant, did you go and pray? Or did y'all walk out to our farm and have my granddaddy make a glyph in stone for her to hold against her belly at night? And by the way, how is young Henry doing? What is he now? Five? Six? Six, Sullivan said, but did not meet Tep's gaze. He looked at the rest of the group. I told y'all. I told y'all this was a mistake, but this wasn't right. Moe's never done anything but help us, and y'all did him in. Then talked us into following along like sheep. Shut your godforsaken mouth, the pastor said. No, I'm done listening to you, Sullivan cried. Tep, listen to me. I never should have listened to them, I know that. They told me Mose was bait just to get y'all out here. I didn't know they was gonna hang him, I swear. I'm goddamn sorry, Tep. I say thanks for my boy every day. And it's only cause of Mose that he's here. Sullivan opened his hands and his rifle hit the dirt with a puff of dust. You check my rifle. I haven't fired a shot. I'm done with this business. You do what you have to, witch. I deserve it. Tep looked at Lila. She raised her eyebrows as if to say, well, he shook his head. Sullivan moaned as Lila released him and he slid down to his knees, weeping. (laughs) Faithless, the pastor roared. All of you, if you had a bit of faith, she couldn't hold you. You understand? Lila, Tep said. Please shut him up. For good. What? The pastor began, but choked on whatever words were coming next. His eyes grew wide as his mouth opened the pink tip of his tongue slipping out from between his yellowed teeth. He fought and struggled, but his teeth came together all the same, clamping down until blood flowed over his chin, and the offending piece of meat tumbled to the dirt. Tip drew the murderer's revolver, the one that had killed his daddy all those years ago, and struck the pastor across the face. The pastor shook his head groggily as the glyph did its work. Did you feel that? Tep asked. Just give it a moment. This glyph here, it'll knock you silly. But I've discovered that after the clouds pass, you're going to be thinking clearly for the first time in a long time. The pastor's eyes found Tep's face, then brightened with tears. You know what you've done now, right? Stone nodded emphatically his face a mask of misery. You know how awful it was, don't you? Another nod, his eyes pleading where his mouth couldn't. Good, Tep said. I wanted you to know what a piece of shit you are before you died. Tep drew the hammer back and fired. 
A rose of blood bloomed around the smoking hole in the pastor's chest. Then he slumped forward and laid still. Tip swept his gun side across the crowd. If any of you plan on continuing to live, you go fetch a wagon and a horse. Then you cut my granddaddy down with the respect he deserves and load him on so I can take him and bury him on his land. They all looked at each other, but there were no refusals. Lila released them and they scattered like roaches by candlelight. Tep holstered his iron, put his hands on his knees, and threw up what was left of his breakfast. He felt a soft hand on his back. Lila stood beside him, her eyes shiny with tears. Tep wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. I'm so sorry, he said. Lila fiercely wrapped her arms around him, and he hugged her back just as tightly. He couldn't hear her thoughts, but he could feel what she would say if she could. I'm sorry, too. Back on the farm, Tip stared down into the hole he and Abel had dug. He didn't know how deep it was supposed to be, but figured it would be all right. Granddaddy would be beside the tomato plants he loved so much. Tep's hands ached, his heart ached. Even his sinuses felt heavy and hot from all of his crying. He backed away as Abel and Sutter carried his granddaddy over, his body wrapped and stitched into a white canvas tarp. They tied ropes around his knees and chest, then lowered the body down gently into the grave. Abel stood and wiped his dirty hands on his jeans. We're, uh, gonna say something if that's okay with you, Tep. Tep nodded. Well, Mosiah, you were always a help to me, to us. Your glyph saved my sorry ass many times over. And we were always welcome on the farm, even if we had to listen to your chide us, insult us. <laughs> And make us sleep in the shed out back. But we were welcome all the same. And I thank you for that. Abel stepped back as Sutter stood up and cleared his throat. <clears throat> Mose, you were a good man. A really good man who deserved better. You had a sharp wit, a green thumb, and you could cook up a damn storm. Thank you for the whiskey and for welcoming us into your home. You will be missed, friend. Sutter stepped away. Abel gave the big man a clap on the back and they looked to Tep. I miss you, Granddaddy, Tep began, trying to keep a knot of sobs from climbing up his throat. It's only been some hours, but I miss you something fierce. I wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for you, and I'm so damn thankful. We've seen demons, a terrible angel, and a host of awful men, so I, I don't know if there's a heaven, and I don't know if I much care anymore, but I hope there's something after. Somewhere you can be at peace with Daddy and Mama and Granny. I love you, Granddaddy, and I hope that I told you that enough while you were with us. Don't fret about that, Sutter said. He knew, Tep. Even if you didn't say it every day, he knew. Abel nodded. He would have been proud of the way you handled yourself today. I know that much. He worried about what would become of you once he was gone. But if he had seen you today, he could have saved himself that worry. Tears made the evening light prism in his vision. <laughs> Thank you both, Tip said. They grabbed their shovels and began filling in the grave, the dirt making a raspy whisper as it fell upon the canvas. Lila put her hand on Tip's arm. He looked up at her. She made a patent gesture in the air, telling him to wait. She picked a ripe tomato from a nearby plant and held it above the grave then squeezed it until the insides fell into the dirt. She dropped the remains, then motioned for him to continue. Tep understood and covered the tomato with the next shovel full of earth. 
then nodded to her as she wiped her hands on her dirt and blood-covered dress. By the time they finished, the sun had sunk below the horizon. All right, Abel said, placing his hands on his hips and stretching his back. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I need to wash up something awful. Y'all can go on, Tep said. I'm going to sit a while longer. You sit, then we'll sit too, Sutter said. But I'm going to go grab Moses' whiskey if it's all right with you. Be my guest, Tep said, and Sutter walked off in the near dark towards the house. Abel sat down beside him. So, I know all this is still fresh, but have you given a thought to what you're going to do next? You know you're welcome to come with us wherever the jobs may take us. I can't imagine why you'd be wanting to stick around here. Teb shook his head. No, I can't stay here. I think I gave what mercy I could muster to those men today. If I stayed, well, I don't know how long I could keep from killing them all. Then why don't we? Shit, give me my knife and a couple of pre-dawn hours. Hmm, and I'll bring death door to door across the whole sorry town. It's been enough killing, Abel. I shot at least seven men dead today. And I ain't saying they didn't deserve it, but I can't do no more right now. We got demons and angels hunting down every living person as far as we know, and I can't bring myself to kill no more than I have to. And if I leave, then I know I can get past the need for vengeance, eventually. I want to be away before I change my mind. You coming with us then? Well, I was hoping y'all would come with us. Sutter returned with the whiskey and passed the open bottle over to Tep. Well, who is us, and where are we talking about? Sutter asked. Me and Lila, Tep said. We're going into the desert. I think we're going to find the torchbearer. Well, if you wanted to die, you could have just stood up while all the bullets were flying earlier, Abel said. You didn't have to walk out into the desert and do it all show-like. Tep took a sip of whiskey, relishing the heat as it ran down his throat. We ain't gonna die, he said. At least not by the torchbearer's hands. He invited me to come find him. If anybody's gonna have answers, it's gonna be him. Lila grasped his hands with hers. Or her, she thought. Or her, Tep said and smiled. What answers are we looking for? Sutter asked. How do we even know what questions to ask? We'll know, Tep said, passing the bottle to Abel's waiting hand. We'll know enough when the time comes. Well, I ain't got shit else to do, I guess, Abel said and took a deep drink of whiskey. He held the bottle out to Lila. She shook her head, then pointed to her mouth. Abel slapped his thigh and rocked back. God damn it. I'm sorry, Lila. I wasn't trying to be funny. Tep felt the common sensation flow into him. She says it's okay, he said. Abel and Sutter looked at each other, then back at Tep. You can communicate with her. Tep nodded. Yeah, but it's only if we're touching, and it's not always words. Sometimes I can just feel what she's feeling. I guess it's quicker than words. More like a gesture. Ask her how she's doing, Abel said. Uh, is she still hurting or anything? She can still hear you, you idiot, Sutter said. They didn't do nothing to her damn ears. I know, but shit. I ain't exactly been in this type of situation before, Sutt. So why don't you get off my damn back about it? We'd been better off if they'd cut out what's left of your brain. At least Lila's tongue was being used. And maybe we should have just left your sanctimonious ass dead on the floor. Sutter laughed. <laughs> Holy shit, Abel. I think that's the most syllables you ever used in the word. How many syllables is this, Sutt? Eat shit, you pig fucker. Their insults flew back and forth until they were both laughing and spilling whiskey over themselves. <laughs> Lila squeezed his hand. Are you sure you want to spend days in the desert with these two? She thought. Tep laughed, and it felt good to do it. <laughs> well, if Granddaddy taught me anything, it's that you've got to work with what you've got. <laughs> she laid her head upon his shoulder, and they sat silently for a while. A breeze came from somewhere at their backs, passed over them and swept out toward the desert.
and that was Rough Beasts, Part 2, by Ryan Harville. I tell you, being touched by the torchbearer isn't all sunshine and rainbows. And if you're excited for Part 3, don't worry. Ryan tops with three hands. No, seriously. He's got three hands. I've seen it. Pretty freaky. A little about Ryan. Ryan Harville writes stories centered around the strange states that are buckled beneath the Bible Belt. He's had stories featured in anthologies, magazines, and podcasts. He currently writes exclusively for the Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights Network and is a proud member of the Horror Writers Association. Ryan also invites you to watch Disney's Steamboat Willie all the way through for the opportunity to watch Mickey Mouse dropkick a suckling piglet, then play its mother's teats like flesh bongos while squeezing her ass like an accordion. He assures you that the entirety of that description is accurate. For more info, please follow him on Twitter at rharvillewrites or visit his website at ryanharvillewriting.com. And do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at ChillinTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our <clears throat> eventual sponsors, you'll eventually support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Stop on by, y'all. And don't forget those submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to hear on this show, send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If your story's selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend, but whatever you're getting up to, be prepared for trouble. And if you're no good with glyphs, make sure you pack a Swiss Army knife. At least you'll have a corkscrew. I'd like to acknowledge a couple more of our YouTube listeners. Calevra558, Andy Siliciano, and Lorraine Saltmarsh. I truly appreciate the comments and support, y'all. Thank you. So, without further ado. Calevra558, Andy Siliciano, and the rain salt marsh. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Wherever you are and whatever you do, remember, go fuck yourselves. Oh yeah, Tim Finley, remember to stay kosher out there in Oregon, bud. And whatever you do, keep that stock rotated. And go fuck yourself. <laughs> Good night, y'all.